I'd like to welcome our guests to our podcast today. We will be discussing Requirement 5 of the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standards, which talks about protecting all systems against malware, and we're going to discuss how that impacts keys and certificates. My name is Christine Drake. I'm with Venify. We deliver next-generation trust protection by securing keys and certificates. And my guests today are Gary Glover and Brandon Benson from Security Metrics. Gary, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Thanks. I'm Gary Glover, and um, I'm a director at Security Metrics and uh, have been a QSA in this industry for about the past uh, almost 10 years now, probably a couple months from 10 years, and uh, have seen the standard grow from uh, zero up to what it is currently now. It's a pretty good standard. So over that period of time, I've had experiences to do all kinds of, obviously, PCI DSS assessments, PA DSS assessments for applications, and um, a lot of consulting, a lot of work with very large corporations all the way down to very small organizations in applying the PCI standard, helping them interpret it and helping them find actual solutions, suggesting things that, that they go look after, technologies that they find procedures and processes for them to put in place so that they can be compliant and stay compliant. Brandon, can you jump in? Absolutely. So my name is Brandon Benson. I've been in the PCI world for about four years. Prior to that, I worked really strongly in the encryption world with so PGP, a little well-known encryption format or algorithm and, and uh, uh, standard out there. Uh, so I've, I've had quite a bit of experience with keys and managing keys and dealing with keys. Uh, I also get to work with companies from all sizes, anywhere from your multi, you know, several thousand employees down to six employees as far as implementing security controls. I also had the op opportunity to work with the payment applications and dealing with security controls and applications to deal with credit card data, as well as a unique opportunity to deal with the point-to-point -point encryption standards for PCI DFS which deals a large amount with keys and management generation and, and processes around key, keeping keys secure. Thanks, Gary and Brandon. I appreciate you introducing yourselves. So why don't we go ahead and jump in. So today I want to talk about threats and specifically requirement five of the PCI DSS. So in this requirement, they actually changed the title in version three so that it indicates protection of all systems against malicious software. They also included a new provision that requires companies to evaluate uncommon systems to see if they require malware. So looking at how that pertains to keys and certificates, we recently saw the Heartbleed vulnerability, which to fully remediate required all keys and certificates to be replaced. And then very recently, we saw a compromise of a behind the firewall system in a health services company that compromised 4.5 million records because the keys and certificates were not updated. And you might have seen that Gardner predicts that 50% of all network threats will use SSL by 2017. So I'd like to get your take on how requirement five applies to keys and certificates. I think there's there's two aspects on malware as far as what we see out, out in the world. I think the primary target for malicious software is to compromise the keys, right? And to steal the keys because if I ha if I can get access to the keys, then I have access to your encrypted data. And I think that's why it's so important to protect the keys. But what we're seeing malware uh, attack, as far as that goes, is we're seeing malware attack vulnerabilities in applications that are using those keys, you know? The malware for Heartbleed, for example, didn't attack the keys. It attacked the OpenSSL vulnerability so it could obtain the keys. And we saw that also, we see that, we saw that in the Beast attack a few years ago with um, CDC for open web applications, where malware, it didn't attack the keys themselves. It meant in the middle of the in initialization vector so that it could recalculate what the encryption keys were. And I think that's what, what five a lot of times talks about, what 3.0 talks about, is we're having to say, well, time out here, you know, 
you need to make sure that your key servers and your certificate authorities and your um, open SSL libraries and your um, patch and update servers are secure because I think that's often been a an area that was neglected in the past you know and I and I so the keys themselves I believe yes are the target but it's not the the strength of the keys that's been attacked it's how the keys are managed and then what systems are being used for and how those attacks are occurring right and I think as far as section 5 Again, you know, over the last, I've seen, I've seen the PCI DSS, you know, morph over the years, and and you know, most of the changes they make are for clarification and making sure that they're adding things. There are some making sure that their people are understanding kind of what the intent of requirements were. Every now and then, there are things that are added. To me, you know, this the section five when they say all systems against malware, I think, I mean, that's always the way it should have been interpreted. And they're just probably just making a, a, a clarification there. And we, as when we as QSAs go through a system, we are supposed to be looking at syst all systems that are in scope and determining how they can affect the security of the of the network. Now, in some ways, you you can define something as being inside a card network zone, but there may be a server outside the card network zone that is critical to the security of the card network and it may be some sort of a shared key server or something like that, then then we would want to extend, even though it may not technically be inside the boundary of the cardholder data network, it may be a service um, that is being used if they have a some sort of a key server defined, we'd want to make sure good controls are placed on that server. And, and you know, that might include kind of this antivirus or anti-malware type of protection. Um, so again, I'm not sure that that's a, a totally new thing, but more of a clarification to make sure people, you know, on both sides, QSA and um, merchant or service provider side, are really, you know, focusing and remembering that, that that we really need to be thinking about your whole process, and especially when keys are involved, you know, that that could be used to, if you got access to these keys because of other vulnerabilities or because of insecurities on a system. You bring a good, good point that it really doesn't matter whether or not the organization sees uh, the, the threats to keys and certificates as an, an uncommon system or a common system that's attacked by malicious software or malware. It, it Really, they're supposed to be looking at their entire environment regardless, and adding that new requirement really is to help just emphasize that they need to be looking at everything. But then, Brandon, you brought up the point, too, that uh, with the keys and certificates, they are more of a target for the, the malware to use. So, they're, you know, it's, it's getting those assets and then compromising them to help with the delivery of, of malware. So it, it sounds like protection would even go beyond just the antivirus solutions, which are obviously critical, but looking at other types of protection that are going to get at, at more of that misuse or compromise of the keys and certificates. And one, you know, one of the things we recommend all our customers do is monitor their key locations. We don't want those keys to be swapped out or modified or changed in any way. Because as you start looking at the security of an environment, whenever you're dealing with encryption, you know, the key, the strength of the key is the key. No pun intended, you know, and the management of those keys is what you have to look at protecting. And if any of those keys are compromised or released or um, in any way um, disclosed, then you've got a system or an, an environment that is that is more vulnerable than one that's not. And so management of keys and cryptography functions and, and misuse of those keys, I think, has a direct impact as far as the security of a cardholder environment. The, the other thing that I wanted to mention is the, the report said that malware was going to be – SSL was going to use the malware, and we started to see malware using in SSL in reverse. In other words, we're starting to see malware exfiltrate data from environments using SSL to send the data out. So even if you are monitoring the networks and stuff like that, we're seeing the SSL being used out to actually exfiltrate data from companies. So it's not it's not like the bad guys don't know the importance and, and the value of encrypting data. 
because now they're using it to encrypt data as it leaves environments. Sounds like it's really important to do that anomaly detection then and making sure that these assets are being used as they're intended to be used and then being able to identify if that's not the case and, and zero in on any issues that might happen. But also it's important to see how protecting keys and certificates is related to other critical security controls and that you really need to be able to look at both, you know, the critical security controls being like antivirus data protection, those aspects, part of that picture needs to also be making sure that keys and certificates are protected because uh, the, the bad guys are using that to bypass um, other controls that would otherwise identify some of their behavior. So, Brendan, I wanted to follow up with, with Heartbleed really being able to compromise uh, those keys and certificates as, a, as an aspect of that threat. Do you think that in audits going forward that it might put a little more focus then on looking at key and certificate security, knowing that we had this big threat that might have compromised those assets? That's a good question. I, I think that the answer, the short answer to that question is yes, we will focus on keys more. Uh, the long answer, a little longer answer to that question is it's not just keys we realize we have to focus on. You know, it's the systems and components supporting those keys that we also have to focus on. You know, a key can be 100% secure. You can store a key like in an HSM, a hardware security module, or a key management server that's 100% isolated from the system. But the moment I need to use that key somewhere like in an in OpenSSL library for receiving web traffic, I need to also realize that I have to put protections and controls around the key in all locations that it's in. And I think Heartbleed let us um, reemphasize the fact that we need to focus on that, make sure that we need make sure that companies and assessors need to understand where all of those keys are located and how those keys are protected, and then ensuring the proper controls are in place to protect them. Um, now, would, would Heartbleed have, would keys have been compromised if he had a completely secure system? Uh, yeah, if you hadn't patched your open SSL, SSL library, um, all those keys would have been compromised anyway. So you could have had a great HSM or a great key management system, but if you had failed to patch, you still would have been compromised. And I think that's what it focuses, is we have to make sure that we're doing everything, not just one aspect of it. So it sounds like Heartbleed has a big ripple effect and that, you know, the ones that companies that were impacted really would have had their keys and certificates stolen regardless of what they were doing to that point. But then what becomes important is the remediation, being able to go out and quickly secure all those systems and all those keys and certificates at that ripple affected through the, the Heartbleed threat. Is that kind of what you're getting at there? Yeah, I mean, companies had to go out and patch the open SSL because that's, that's what Heartbleed attacked to be able to steal the secret keys. And then once they patched their open SSL libraries, then they had to go out and issue new private keys for everybody. And I think that's, that may have been what was kind of lost in some things where we saw some companies go out and just patch but not replace their keys, and some companies not patch and replace their keys thinking they were okay, right? And so what you end up with when you look at security is it's this multi-layer effect or this ripple effect as you, as you comment, saying, okay, we understand or we recognize the vulnerability. How did it affect our environment? Um, we're going to patch and we're going to replace keys and we're going to do something else because a file integrity monitoring or a malware or something would not have, would not have addressed or would not have recognized that that type of attack was happening. So it really sounds like it is a, a stepped approach and that there's this new focus on making sure that all of those elements go secure as you're doing additional audits, it's making sure it's, whether it's Heartbleed or other attacks, you have to make sure the remediation is done. As, and I would, I would assume you kind of look at that, whatever the latest attacks might be, um, when you're doing audits. Yeah, that's something... Um, any QSA I believe should consider as part of that process. As we learn about new vulnerabilities, we're communicating those to our customers all the time. Just as we're telling our customers to go out and get third-party resource information as far as vulnerabilities that pop up, we also subscribe to the same types of lists. 
So as we see vulnerabilities pop up that may affect some of our customers, it's not uncommon in my case, at least, to email my customers saying, hey, I know you're using OpenSSL. Have you seen this? Or, hey, I know you're using um, Oracle or MySQL or Postgres. Have you seen these vulnerabilities that were just released today? So that they're aware of that as well. That's great. It's wonderful that you provide that insight to your customers. Uh, I really enjoyed this discussion on the threats. I felt like that was uh, really some good insights on what happens with with threats in the QSA reviews. So this is Gary. Let me let me. I want to make one kind of final comment. Um, we need to realize that the, the kind of the new some some statements in section five. You know, specifically five one two. It says, you know, when you're looking at systems that you don't think are commonly affected by viruses, don't just ignore them for all time. I mean, the real point of that requirement is sometimes things change. And if you say right now, oh, I'm using Linux or I'm using OS X or something that that isn't commonly affected by virus, well, it might be this month and it might be next month, but what about six months, what about a year? It, it's really trying to make people remember that this is a business as usual kind of process that, that even though you think a system is out of scope for, for antivirus or malware protection, you really want to be aware of the, you know, what's going on in industry and what's going on with, you know, the vulnerabilities and stuff. And it may be that that one year or at one point that system is out of scope for antivirus or ma anti-malware or, or, you know, protection of those kind of things. And, and now it is, right, based on the new things that are happening. So I think that's kind of the main point of those systems that, you know, when we say they're not commonly protected or they're not commonly affected by viruses now, will they be later? Excellent point, Gary. And it, and they need to actually continue to look at those things over time and not expect yeah. that it's finished after being reviewed once. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a really good way to put it. Thanks, Gary. I think that really rounds up this topic for today. So I want to thank our listeners. Uh, again, you've been listening to Gary Glover and Brandon Benson from Security Metrics, which helps merchants with security and compliance, and that definitely covers the PCI DSS version 3. I'm with Venify. We deliver next generation trust protection. We help defend keys and certificates against the threats we've been talking about today. We monitor their usage, establish a baseline, and note anomalous behavior, which helps with the kill chain and helps protect these critical assets. Thank you for joining us today.